Let us bow our heads before we open our Bibles. So I was giving you a little bit of time to get your Bibles, okay? So get your Bibles. If you, if you have to get up from your, from your living room or whatever to grab your Bible, I want you to get your Bible. I want you to go to uh, Luke chapter 9, and, and we are going to be there. Uh, uh, our sermon uh, today has to do about the view, the view from the top of the mountain, the view from the top of the mountain, okay? And, and uh, that's the title that we have today, the view from the top of the mountain. And I want you to go to Luke chapter 9. So I'm giving you a little bit of time. I'm talking here, giving you a little bit of time, those who don't have their Bibles, to bring their Bibles. This is a Bible study. There's a living room. We're in a Bible study. I'm not behind a pulpit where I can walk up and down and, 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 and do my preaching. Uh, I'm, I'm going to be just study the word with you let us bow our heads for prayer god uh, uh, bless you is luke chapter 9 luke chapter 9 okay let us uh, bow our heads for prayer dear heavenly father we thank you so much for your blessings and we thank you for giving us the opportunity to be here and i ask that you may help me lord in the study of your scriptures may we come to you and may we be able to receive light and word from you today in the name of jesus we pray amen amen okay we're going to go to luke chapter 9 verse 21 and we're going to start there on on verse 21 and uh and and just study and we're going to be talking about the mount of transfiguration you remember that when jesus invited his disciples up to the mountain remember uh peter john and james he invited that little special group that he had i want you to know that jesus had the 12 disciples but within the 12 disciples he had a special group uh, that he that he that he was very close to and those were the three that he invited up to the mountain but i want us to look a little bit of the context and and for us to be able to understand what was going on here in the mount of transfiguration we need to um we need to look a little bit about the context and if we if we go to uh john uh if, if we go there to luke chapter 9 um um if we go there um, you, you will see that Jesus is talking about suffering. If we go there, verse 21, and he says, strictly warned and commanded them uh, uh, to, to tell this to no one. But if we go, uh, we go saying the son of man, verse 22, must suffer many things. He's beginning to prepare his disciples for difficult times. Why? Because the disciples only saw Jesus up to now. They were seeing him as a victorious Messiah that would become powerful. And, and he was preparing them saying, listen, following me is not going to give you all these victories. It's not going to be good and dandy all the time. It's not going to be a path of roses you need to understand that very difficult times are coming the son of man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders of the chief priests and scribes and be killed i mean they, they were listening to whatever and be killed i thought you're going to overcome the romans and be raised on the third day then if we look at verse 23 it tells us then he said to them if anyone desires if anyone desires to come after to me let him deny himself and take up, take up his cross daily and follow me so he's telling them listen uh, this is not about greatness this is actually about denying yourself this is actually about giving up of yourself and 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 this was crucial this was crucial because the disciples, they had their own dreams. They had their own wants. They had their own dreams of greatness. <clears throat> and Jesus was saying, listen, you have to give that up. And one of the problems that we sometimes have as Christians is that we, we want to follow Jesus, but we want to follow him with our own wants and desires. We, we want our own things. You know, uh, uh, Peter and, and, and John uh, didn't pick up their boat 
and follow Jesus with their boat on top of their shoulders, uh, they had to leave their boat. They had to leave their nets. They had to leave those things to follow Jesus. And, and, the, and the thing is that sometimes we, we want to be able to follow Jesus with our own dreams and we don't know that God already has has a plan for us. And in fact, the plan that God has for us is 10 times better than the one that we have for ourselves. So that's why it says, anyone who desires to come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. Take up his cross. All of us have a cross, people. All of us have a cross. All of us have some sort of difficulty in our lives that is just hitting us. And, 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 and sometimes we think that God has to solve that difficulty in our lives before we follow him. Paul had a problem. Theologians don't know what the problem was. And Paul said, God, heal me from this problem. And God said, you know what, Paul? Let my grace be sufficient to you. So a lot of times we might have a cross and I don't know what that cross is with you. And, and some people want to wait till the cross gets taken for us to then follow Jesus. And no, whatever your problem is, whatever your difficulty is, come and follow me with the cross. Pick up your cross and follow me. Don't wait till the cross gets taken away for you to follow Jesus, okay? So he's talking about difficult times. He's talking about, you know, in, in our life as, as Christians, how we deal with these difficult times and he's warning us as Christians when you enter into a battle, when you, when you are coming against this world, you're gonna confront difficulties and you're gonna confront problems. Verse 25 uh, 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 tells us, for what profit is a man if he gains the whole world and he himself uh, destroyed or lost? In other words, maybe you say, God, that's it. I'm gonna follow my own dreams. My own dreams are better than yours. I, I'm going to do what I want to do. And I want, and God says, that's okay. You can do that. But what does it profit you when at the end of your life, you lose everything and you lose eternity. You lose, you lose all of that. Verse 26 tells us the following for whoever is ashamed of me and my words of him, the son of man will be ashamed when he comes in his own glory and in his father's and his father's and of the holy angels. So uh, uh, Jesus is preparing his disciples to deny themselves, to be faithful because there are going to be difficult times in our lives and what happens is that Jesus knows human nature and 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 he knows how real this world is to us and Jesus knows how real our pain is okay this life is something that we experience. This life is something that we confront. What happens to us in this life is something that we feel. We feel within our deepest of our, of our hearts and our minds. We feel and, and we experience the pain and the suffering in this earth. And most of us in our lives, we have experienced that pain and that suffering. And many of us are even experiencing pain and suffering right now in our lives. So uh, I want you, I, I want to talk a lot about today experiencing, experiencing. So Jesus is telling and he is preparing them. You will have trouble. You will have pain. You will have issues in this world. You must deny yourself. You must, you know, so he's going through all of this with them that the disciples right then really did not even understand what Jesus was talking about. This was something difficult for them because they they really had other expectations of, of God. So when you look at the Mount of Transfiguration, you have to understand it within that context. And you know something, people, it, it, when you read the Bible and you really study it in its context, God is so patient with us. And God understands what we're going through. God understands our suffering and God doesn't just say, you know what? Yeah, you're going to have suffering. You're going to have pain. You're going to have this. You're going to have that, you know, in your life. You're going to have that. Well, you know what? Take it or leave it. God doesn't do that. 
God doesn't do that. If you remember when we've been studying our studies in John chapter 6, when the, uh, Jesus fed the 5,000 and the disciples wanted Jesus to, to, uh, uh, to become Messiah, remember that? He wanted Jesus to, they wanted Jesus to become the Messiah, and Jesus didn't do it. The disciples were upset. They get on the boat. Jesus tells them, get on the boat, get to the other side, because they were trying to force Jesus to become the, the Messiah, and, and they're out there doubting, oh, man, I wonder if this guy is really real. I wonder, you know, maybe we're following the, the wrong person. All of a sudden, Jesus was up there on the mountain. He was praying for them, and then a storm comes, and in the middle of the storm, Jesus comes, and he walks on the water, and as Jesus walks on the water, he takes all their doubt away. Just as, just as this world gives us trouble and gives us difficulty, God all of a sudden shows up, and he shows us his glory. Glory. Isn't that amazing? He knows. He sees our doubt. He sees our issues. He sees that we're suffering. And then he does something, you know, he does something and he, and he, and, and, and he shows us his glory. He shows us his glory. I remember in my, in my life, you know, as I was, I was, I was studying to, to you know, you know, you know, to become a pastor, uh, you know, at first I wasn't really pastor material and, and, and I just wasn't sure, you know, if this is what God really wanted me to do. And in those moments of doubts and pain where I would, where I would see, see, uh, because the devil will try to show you signs and this world will try to show you signs that you should not be what God wants you to be. Be careful. Okay, be careful because sometimes God's people say, well, maybe that's not what God wants me to do because you're confronting certain difficulties to accomplish that. Don't back off because usually when you're going to do something that is really godly, the devil is going to try to put obstacles. Those obstacles do not mean that you should not do it. Actually, those obstacles mean you must come. I says, whoa, God must really want to do something big with me. Because look how Satan is trying to stop me. Look how the world is trying to stop me. So never let obstacles and difficulties take away what God has for you. Because sometimes they become a reason for people to back off. And I remember as I, was, as, as I was doubting that, and to this day, I will remember this. Because it is moments of glory where God gives you. He gives you a, a snippet here and a snippet there of his glory so that you can get through these difficult times that he was talking to his disciples. And, and I remember I had a dream, and I was doubting that. And I had a dream, and I had a dream. I was living in my first house in Philadelphia when we came from this country, uh, we came from our country to, 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 to Philadelphia. And I remember in that dream, me coming out of my, me coming out the door and standing on the steps. If you live in Philadelphia or in the, in, in, in the north, you had these row houses that were, you know, one stuck to each other. And then you had these steps that, you know, you came down the steps. And I'm standing on the, on, on the top of the steps. I come out the door and I look up. And after I look up, I see, I see something weird in the sky. It was, it was something that was moving around. And all of a sudden, I see this scroll, a scroll come down from heaven. And the scroll comes down, and a hand, two hands, spread out the scroll. And when I look at the scroll, the scroll said a phrase. It said, you are my servant. And that was it. That was the dream. And I woke up from that. And the thing is, is that snippet of his glory, that snippet when I was doubting, when I was going through difficulties, God showed up. You know what I say? Showed up and showed off. And he showed up in my life. These, these little snippets that God shows us to take us through difficult times. God was telling, Jesus was telling his disciples, listen, you're going to have pain. You're going to have suffering. You're going to have to deny yourself. I'm going to be killed. I am going to be killed. So by them seeing Jesus killed, that was going to be big. Whoa, the Messiah can't get killed. <laughs> the Messiah can't be, whoa, it was going to hit them. So just as Jesus was telling them, uh, I'm going to be killed, Jesus says, hold up, I'm going to show you something else. <laughs> you see where I'm going? 
Okay, you see me, I'm telling you I'm going to be killed, right? I'm telling you they're going to put me in a tomb, right? I'm telling you that they're going to beat me and they're going to nail me to a cross, right? Right. But I'm going to show you something else. I'm going to show you something else about me. What does he do? He takes his three disciples to the Mount of Transfiguration. And he says, I'm going to show you something amazing about me. You have never seen this. In fact, he tells them, don't tell anybody. Don't tell anybody that you saw this till I have resurrected. Don't tell anybody. But it's incredible how God, how Jesus said, you know what? I know this discourages you. I know this puts you in difficulties. But I'm going to show you something. I'm going to show you what I can do for you. I'm going to show you a little bit of who I am. If we look at verse 27, if we look at verse 27, he says, but I tell you truly, there are some standing here who shall not taste death till they see the kingdom of God. And the thing is that sometimes people read this verse and they don't understand it. And he was actually talking about Peter, John, and James because they were going to see what they were going to see on that mountain when they went up with Jesus. And verse uh, uh, 28 says, now it came to pass about eight days after these sayings, okay, after he had told them all these things about him dying, about him going to the cross, about him being punished, about him doing all this, eight days later, okay, after these sayings, he took Peter, John, and James and went up to the mountain to pray. Verse 29, it says, as he prayed, he appeared, he, he, the appearance of his face was altered and his robe became white and glistening. And behold, two men talked with him who were Moses and Elijah. And in and, and the scriptures there, um, in, in Deuteronomy 34, it talks about the death of Moses. Now, it's interesting about something about the death of Moses that it says that he went up to the mountain by himself and he was up there and God up at the top of the mountain showed Moses the land that he was not going to step into, but the land that he was going to take the people to. And he showed him the land. And it says that Moses died up there. And in fact, if you read, it says that he talking about, and if you read that, he is a capital H. God himself was the one who buried Moses. But it's interesting that when you go to Jude chapter 1, verse 9, it tells us in Jude chapter 1, verse 9, that the archangel Michael came and fought the devil for the body of Moses. And if you go to the book of Deuteronomy, it says that no one ever knew where Moses had been buried. No one ever found his tomb. So, and then Elijah, we know the story of Elijah being taken up in a chariot. So it seems, seems like these two were in heaven and that God said, well, Moses, you know, I'm not going to give you uh, the, the, the opportunity of entering into the land, but... I'll just take you home with me, <laughs> you know. I'll just take you home with me. And I know that a lot of people always say, well, I can't believe that because of one sin, uh, Moses was not about to enter the land. Stop that. He, he, the man is in heaven, okay? All right? So Moses is probably up there looking down and says, who's complaining? You hear me complaining? You know? So, uh, so it appeared, so they, they came and they, and they, um, and they were there, okay, and they were there with, uh, that, was, that was what, verse uh, 29, okay, uh, verse 30, now verse 31, okay, uh, verse 31 tells us, who appeared in glory and spoke of his decease, talking about, spoke of his pain, spoke of his suffering, spoke of his death. So they came to speak to Jesus of his death, which he was about to accomplish at Jerusalem. Now verse 32, but Peter and those with him were heavy asleep. Isn't it interesting as I read this verse, I said, man, these dudes are always sleeping. 
You know, later on at, at, at the Garden of Gethsemane, Jesus goes to play and they fall asleep again. It, you know, it's interesting that as we sleep, Jesus is praying. As they were asleep, Jesus was praying, and Jesus was dealing with the salvation. And, and when they were fully awake, they saw his glory. And, and listen to this. They saw, and they were fully awake, they saw his glory. They saw Jesus as divine. They saw his glory in the two men who stood with him. Look at verse, uh, verse 33. Verse 33, then it happened as they were parting from him that Peter said to Jesus, now here's the human talking, okay? Here's the human talking. Master, it is good for us to be here and let us make three tabernacles for one for you and one for Moses and one for, Eje one for Elijah. And I like how Luke says, not knowing what he's talking about. Okay, and the thing is, and you know that this stuff that I talked to you about, about the homes and meeting homes and everything, when I read this, this wouldn't hit me. You know, because we say, well, let us build a big church here. Let us build a big church here for us and let us have this place for us so that we can have our seminars and we can seminar each other to death and we can have big lunches and we can have our feast and we can have our parties and we can have all stuff. Let's, and God's saying, no, I need you guys to spread out. I need you guys to spread out. It's not about these four. This is when that hit me. And we, like Peter, say, oh, we like this place. Oh, let us make a tabernacle for you, one for Elijah, one for Moses, and one for us. Oh, see, all of a sudden, we become exclusive. It's about us. It's about our thing. It's not about the world that needs to be saved. It's not about our, my neighbor who don't even know about Jesus. It's not about other people. No, that, you know, that's the spirit you get from these people that say, oh, we're going to, we got to hide in the hills. We got to, you know, we got to do this. Why? They're not even thinking of their neighbors. They haven't invited their neighbor one time to church. They haven't given their neighbor a Bible study. They haven't tried to make friends with their neighbors or anything, but they want to hide in the hills. Why? Because it's all about them. And Peter here, he's like, oh, the Pharisees and the scribes were over there. Oh, this is perfect. Oh, wow. When they saw this, you know, and, and they saw, oh, you know, let's make this about us. And, 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 and I like how the verse ends there saying, but he didn't know what he was talking about. He didn't know that it was bigger than them. He didn't know that Jesus came to save the world. And sometimes, people, we want to limit God to what we can do. We want to limit God to our desires, and God has bigger and greater goals. That's why sometimes God has to, like when, when, the, when, the, when the Christians were in Jerusalem, he had to bring a persecution to spread them all over the world. And, and, and now he brings this pandemia to get us to, to have church everywhere. And I'm telling you that this is God-led. Why I'm telling you that this is God-led? Because I know the people that, I, people that I'm reaching that I would have never reached without this. Amen. I know that. I know that God is using this for, for, for his glory. And we can get so locked into our community, our people, our friends, our family, we can get so locked into that and, and we forget that, that the mission is not about us enjoying our fellowship together and staying there. Our mission is Jesus. Jesus saying, listen, I am coming soon and you guys are sitting around. I need to spread this out. We need to spread out. And all this stuff about confining ourselves to one place, you know, people in the future, I, I, I want to see our church building as a place to celebrate, coming together once a week to celebrate, but during the week, we must be in our homes preaching the word of God. We must be making each home a place to preach. We must be inviting our neighbors. We, we must have a building that only holds 300 people, but a, but a church that is as 1,000 people. 
and we need to come together two, three times in one to, to be able to worship together. But we cannot let our four walls limit the growth of the church. And that's what we've been doing. Peter here, he's like, oh man, let's, let's do this. All of a sudden, exclusivity, it's all about them. It's all about the, he didn't even include the other 12, the other nine. Oh, it's just about us. We must be special. We must be special. Hey, one for John, one for, one for James, one for me, you know, you guys. He didn't even include the other nine. Okay, it was all about them. And we see that a lot of times people is the way we, we think. But thank God that God shows us something different. And Jesus came to save the world. You know, and they later on uh, learned that. Uh, um, verse 34, verse 44 tells, while he was saying this, a cloud came and overshadowed them. And they were, be they were uh, fearful as they entered I entered the cloud, the cloud. So now the cloud covered the disciples and, and involved them all in there. Oh my God, you know, can you, can you imagine the experience from eight days before? The context is eight days before. I'm going to be killed. I am going to be buried. I am going to go through this. They're like, oh man, but and Jesus is going, man, these guys, they can't take this. I got to show them a little bit. Let me show them a little snippet so that they can get through this. And he takes them and it says, and a voice came out of the, and the cloud came all over them. They were like, woo. I mean, they were like, oh my God, this is, this is amazing. Elijah was there. Moses was there. Christ in full glory. And they're seeing their master now in his full glory. I mean, even, even Jesus' robe became white. Even, uh, I mean, all of this was happening. And the cloud brought them in. And all of a sudden, a voice came out of the cloud saying, this is my beloved son. Could you imagine that voice coming? And the, I mean, it probably, that voice probably penetrated their whole body saying, this is my son hear him and then if we see that we read uh, um, it says when the voice had seized Jesus was found alone but they kept quiet I, I'll be quiet too you know they kept quiet and, and when Jesus was found they kept quiet and told no one in those days any of the things that they had seen as you read this in the other gospels it says in, in Matthew and Mark, it says that Jesus told them, do not say this to anyone until I have resurrected. We live in two experiences. And the disciples there had two experiences. And Jesus gave them the second experience of seeing him who he really was. Because he understood what they were going through. He understood when he tells them, you know, I'm, I'm going to die. They are going to kill me. And they had this view, how, how could that happen? How, how could that be? But then he gives them this snippet of his glory that they could, they could really hang on to. We live in two experiences. As human beings, we're caught between two experiences. We're caught between the earthly and the heavenly experience. You're caught between the pain and the suffering that you go through with your children, the pain and the suffering that you go through with disease. You're caught between the pain and the suffering that you go through financially. Those are real experiences. But we are also have our heavenly experience. And we, were, and we will tend to go more to the more real experience. We will tend to go with the one that is more real to us and the one that gives the greatest satisfaction. We are caught between two experiences. Now, the problem that we have is which one, the question that we need to ask ourselves is which one is more real to us? Because we tend to go with the one that is more real, the one we can feel the strongest. The one is a theory. If, 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 if one is a theory, if one is a theory and one is ex an experience, you're going to go with the experience. 
Remember that if one is just a belief, if one is just a theory, you're going to go with the experience at some point. At some point, you must go to the mountain and get a view from the top. At some point, you must have that mountain experience where you are able to see the glory of God, where you are able to, to, to experience the strength of God, the power of God. And, and what happens, people, is that, is that a lot of Christians are living off of the experience that they hear from somebody else, living off the experience that they learn, living off the experience that they read, but they have never been to the mountain themselves. I'm telling you, Peter and James and John, they did not come from the mountain the same thing. When they came down, they were probably had this little smirk on their face like, we know something you don't know. I'm sure they could not have kept it without me having that smirk in their face, knowing, hey, I, I'm not saying anything, Jesus, I promise you, I'm not going to say anything. But you could see a look in their face that they had experienced something that the others had not experienced, and they knew that they had seen something that no one has seen before. See, we as Christians need to have our own mountain experience. On the Mount of Transfiguration, uh, Jesus got a view, uh, uh, the disciples got a view from the top we just experience a view with Jesus from the top because only when we have a real experience with God will we will really understand only from the top will we really understand the reality of this world as I, I remember last, well, one of the last mission trips we went to, we went to Dominican Republic and, and, and uh, during the night we went up to this restaurant called the God's Hammock, God's Hammock. And it was way up in the mountains, way up there. And we, you were up there, you could see half Dominican Republic from up there. You know, while you were, while you were down there, uh, you, could, you could barely see anything. And while you were down there, all you could see was around you. But you couldn't see the full picture. Only when you went up to the top of the mountain is that you could see the real picture. And what I, tell you, I want to tell you that only from a mountain experience with God is that you can actually come to see the reality of this world. Because a lot of times we're blinded by, by the reality of this world. And we tend to go with what we experience. So if you've never experienced God in your life, if you've never had, if you've never seen the glory of God, if you don't have snippets to go back to, because God gives us little snippets in our life, of his glory to help us through the pain and the suffering and the reality of what we go through in this world, God gives us little snippets so, for us so that we can also deal with the pain and suffering of the reality of this world. He gives us these snippets where he shows us his glory. You know, and in moments of pain and suffering, we say, well, God, you know, where, 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 are, where are you? And then all of a sudden, the Holy Spirit begins to remind us, remember then? Remember back then? Remember how Jesus showed us his glory? Remember how? And then we say, how can I deny those realities? How can I deny them? Many are fooled by this world because they have never had a view from the top. And if you've never had a view from the top, you need to look for that view from the top. You need to, and, and the way you get that view from the top is really coming down and spending time in the word of God, spending time in prayer and saying, God, I need you to show yourself to me. And, and when you ask God to show himself to you, God will show himself to you. But you need to look for it and when you, you need to desire and you need to look for that reality so that you can also get a mountain experience with 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 God. God gives us all those special moments, that experience, those experiences that we can't deny. God calls us to experience him. God's reality must be real in our lives. If God is just a theory, if God is just a belief, if God is just a philosophy, you're not, you're going to go with the reality. As human beings, we go with the reality. And if the pain and suffering and, and, and the wants of this world are your reality and Jesus is just a philosophy and an idea, then you're going to go with the reality.
The only way that we are able to stay faithful to God is when God's reality becomes just as real or even more real than the things of this earth, looking for that mountain experience. In fact, Peter, uh, uh, later on, uh, tells us the following in 2 Peter uh, verse uh, chapter 1. 2 Peter chapter 1, uh, we see what he tells us there, um, verse 16 to 18. 2 Peter chapter uh, uh, chapter 1, verse 16 to 18 says, for, for we, now this is many years later, he says, for we did not follow cunningly devised fables when we uh, made known, uh, when we made known, when we made known to you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. But we eyewitness his majesty. Says we eyewitness his majesty. For we receive from God. Listen to this. We receive from God the Father honor and glory. When such a voice came to him from the excellent glory. This is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. And we heard his voice which came from heaven when we were with him. On, on that holy mountain. So Jesus, here the disciples in, in 2 Peter, Peter remembers back and he says, I remember when we, we, we were there on that mountain. So we're not, we are not following verse 16, for we do not follow cunningly devised fables when we made known to you. In other words, listen, we were there. You're not hearing gossip. And Jesus and Peter, one of the last books written, you know, before he passes away, you know, Peter rises and he says, listen, we're not messing with you. We're not talking about gossip. We're not talking about hearsay. We were there. And Peter, through his whole life, through his suffering, through the moments they put him in prison, through the moments to, to the last moment when they crucified him upside down, Peter had that mountain experience with Jesus that took him through all of the pain. The problem where we fail sometimes, people, is that this world becomes more real to us than God. When this world becomes more real to us than God, then we have a problem in being able to stick with God through the pain and the suffering because God has not been real to us. So what is my conclusion today? My conclusion today is that if you have not had that mountain experience from God where you're able to see the world from the mountain and get a, and get a mountain view, you have to look for it. You have to look for it, and that is through a season of prayer, through a season of study in the word, when you're saying, God, I really want to know you. I remember when I, when I as a young man, had finally decided to leave the world and say, I, I, want, to, I want to really follow God. I, I remember me, I remember I went and I got my Bible, and I said, God, I need to experience you. I, I, it can't be anymore what my parents taught me. It can't be anymore what I, what I know from other people. I, I really have to experience you. <laughs> people, and at some point, you and your spiritual life, maybe your, your experience has very, been very vague. I'm telling you, you got to look for that mountain view. You got to go up to the mountains at some point and you have to experience the glory of God in a great way. Because that view and that experience and, that, and when you experience that glory of God in your life, that is what's going to take you through the difficult moments. What happens, why, why a lot of times Christians have such a superficial life, such a superficial relationship with God, is because they have never really experienced God. The reason why they question everything, the West, reason why they question the Bible, the reason why they question church, the reason why they question many things is because they have never been up to the mountain and experienced his glory. That is something that you and I have to do.
As Jesus invites us, we must come to the point in our life to say, God, I want to experience you. I want to see your reality. Because what happens, people, when you don't experience the reality of God, then other things in this world become your reality. Your pain becomes your reality. Your suffering becomes your reality. The issues in your job become your reality. Your sickness becomes your reality. And when all those things become your reality, there is no way that you're going to be able to overcome reality with a theory. You can't overcome reality with a theory. You can't, become, you can't overcome reality with a belief. You can't overcome uh, your reality with, with, with what other people are teaching you. you. At some point, God needs to become your reality. And as the disciples were suffering and as they were going through everything and as they saw what was happening to Jesus, as they saw him crucified, later on they were able to go back and say, and say I saw his glory. I saw his glory. I heard the voice say, this is my son. I heard the voice At some people, at some point in your life, people, you must hear the voice. Do not let your spiritual experience just be hearsay or, you know, I'm here because there's nothing else to do. You must desire, and today I I want you to desire, I want you to want that mountain experience with God. I want you to desire to see his glory. I want you to read his word like never before and say, God, I want you to be real to me. I want you to show your glory to me. I am going to get on my knees and I am going to start praying and I am going to have a season of prayer and I'm going to dedicate this time for prayer and I am going to dedicate this time to Bible study and I am going to let go of everything else because I need to experience you. God needs to become more real to us than the realities of this world. If not, the realities of this world are going to overcome you. They will overcome you. And that's why Jesus gave those snippets of his glory to his disciples because he knew that they were going to become, they were going to confront uh, different little realities of this world that was going to try to tear down their faith and they needed to have a spiritual reality. They needed to have a godly reality to hang on to. If you don't have that godly reality, it's very easy for you to fall away Look for that mountain view. You got to get up on the mountain of transfiguration. You got to be up there with Jesus. You got to experience his glory. And only from up there, when you look at the reality of this world, you can laugh at it because you have a greater reality, which is God. God has to become a reality to us and more than just a belief. Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you so much because you always give us those special moments in life where we are able to experience you and we're able to experience your reality and those realities carry us through the difficult times in this world and they carry us through the realities of sin, through the realities of this world. Bless us and help us, Lord, to be able to get a view from the mountain to be able to get a view from the mountains and see the realities of this world. We ask that you may help us to look for that reality in you. In the name of Jesus, we pray, amen. God bless you. And 